Hello and welcome from Casa Co in Santiago, Chile to this episode of Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where I have conversations with entrepreneurs doing business across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on those with some connection to Latin America. My guest today is Komal Dadlani, co-founder and CEO of lab for You, a company that helps kids learn science via smartphone experiments. Originally from northern Chile and born to Indian immigrant parents, Komal always knew she wanted to make an impact on the world from a very young age. We cover growing up as the daughter of immigrants in a very conservative society, how she fell in love with science, and how a startup weekend launched her down the path of helping kids all over the world learn more about science. We also talk about what it's like raising money and running a startup in the male-dominated worlds of both Latin America and Silicon Valley, how she raised money from NGOs, Latin America, and Silicon Valley investors, and her advice to other entrepreneurs who are thinking about just getting started. Be sure to tune in next week to listen to part two of this podcast, where Komal turns it around on me and asks me the questions she always wanted to know about venture capital. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Komal Dadlan. Hello, Komal. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, this is going to be fun. We've been trying to do this for maybe a year and a half now, I think. Yeah, I think so I'm glad. Exactly two years, I guess. So. I think yeah, from right from the beginning of when when we wanted when we started the podcast. So this is this is going to be fun to finally be able to do it. Yes, I'm excited. So where are we in the world today? Right now, we've able we've been able to match our schedules in traveling to Santiago, Chile. We're right now at a co-working space called Casaco. It's a great co-working space with lots of companies, and we and Lab for You is one of the companies in this space. How long have you been working out of Casa Co? Uh, we've been working here for the past two years. We started in a small office uh, downstairs, and we were, I think we were first four, then five, then we were able to manage eight in an office for four, <laughs> <laughs> until we realized we had to move, and we moved to the second floor, which has a bigger office, where we are today, but last year, I think no, last to last year we had to go back to the small office because we reduced our team and then we had to come back again. So the story of a startup. Yeah. <laughs> so Casago was able to give us that flexibility. So tell me a little bit about Lab for You. What do, what do you guys do? Yeah, at uh, Lab for You we are democratizing science and changing the way science is taught by transforming smartphones and tablets into science labs. So what we basically do is we design experiments that use the sensors of the phone, let's say the microphone or the accelerometer, and we design experiments so that students and teachers around the world can experiment with the lab in their pockets. So what kind of experiments are kind of the most fun or most, most interesting ones? Yeah, so we've got a ton of experiments uh, that use the sensors. So our first uh, product is Lab for Physics, which is our physics lab, and we're soon going to launch Lab for Chemistry, which is the chemistry app. And in Lab for Physics, uh, you've got experiments. Do you know the difference between distance and displacement? I don't think that I do. <laughs> well, then I invite you to download <laughs> Lab for Physics and run some of our experiments so that you can uh, understand those differences. So one experiment would be, um, it's called uh, bungee jumping, like hook on, mm -hmm. where we teach, teach students about hook's law and spring constants. So they have to take their phones, put it in a plastic bag, recyclable plastic bag, please, uh, connect it to a spring and analyze the constant of a spring. Um, yeah, now. I think the last science class I took was in junior year of high school, so it's been a while. Yeah. So I need, we, need a refresher. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and we see that many students uh, are challenged by how theoretical physics, chemistry, and science can be, and we make it practical and experiential. So it's like learning how to ride a bicycle reading a book, where we would give you, we don't want to give you a book to learn how to ride a bicycle, we want you to experiment and see the world around you and, and live science in a different way. No, it's awesome. And we'll jump into, we'll dig deeper into the company in a little bit, but I wanted to go back to you and your story. And a so, hard question. So where, where are you from originally? I'm originally from Chile. I was born and brought up in Chile, actually in the north of Chile, Arica, which is a very small city. Uh, people normally visit Iquique, uh, they don't go to my city, Arica. I was born in Arica and a uh, daughter of an immigrant family, Indian immigrants, um, living here in Chile. My parents moved uh, to Chile about 30 years ago. I was born here and when I was about four or five years 
old, they decided to move from Arica to Santiago because they didn't find good schools in Arica. And they decided to say, we need our Indian kids to study in a good school uh, in Santiago. Do you remember much about growing up to start in Arica? Uh, yes, I remember playing a lot the beach, uh, the aceitunas de azapa, uh, Moro de Arica. I, I do have like childhood memories, uh, but but not much, not more than that. I remember speaking Spanish and him with Hindi and with so I remember that aspect of my life, like mixing languages, like Indian parents, um, Chilean country, and a mother that wanted me to learn English and was desperate for me to learn English more than Hindi. Something about the Indian culture, like if you don't know English, you're like not good society or something like that, which is crazy. Well, I'm grateful for their investment because I'm having this conversation with you with some decent English. <laughs> like better than decent. <laughs> <laughs> so, not my credit, it's their credit. And why, why did they choose Chile? Uh, it's serendipity and craziness, I would say. Uh, so a bit about history. After India and Pakistan per partition, many Indians from the north, Sindhis, uh, they were without land. Like the Hindus had to go, the Hindus in the north had to go to India, the Muslims from the south had to go to Pakistan. So Sindhis, which is where my parents are from, Sin, uh, they had to move around the world. So there were some Sindhi families in different parts of the world, mainly London, Hong Kong, uh, New Jersey, uh, in Europe or South Africa, but Chile is very random, right? So before the Panama Channel uh, started operating, most of the ships would go through Magallanes, right? So to go from the Pacific to the Atlantic, you had to go through Magallanes. Uh, so there was this Indian family uh, that uh, went through Magallanes, stayed in Punta Arenas, and that's where they invited my dad to work. Uh, but then when the Panama Channel opened, business went down, the Chilean government said, we need free ports, no taxes. So Iquique and Punta Arenas are places with no taxes. That's why you have Sofi. I'm sorry, I'm digging into Chilean um, economical history uh, a little bit. So that's where Indians, um, some Chinese do their business, like ex import export uh, in Punta Arenas and in Iquique. And my dad started working in a company in, in Punta Arenas and then moved to um, Iquique, Sofri, and then Arica. So for, for people that maybe don't know Chile's geography, that's from one end of the country all the way to the yeah. other. And it may not look like it on a map, but that's basically like going from New York to LA. Yes. It's that far. That's far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And so you moved to Santiago. If you take Chile mm -hmm. north to south, like Arica to Punta Arenas, and you flip it, uh, and you place it on a map in, in, in the US, you can go from east to west. Uh, that's that's pretty long. It's super long. And people don't realize, like, when you're in Santiago, you're two-thirds of the way up to yeah. the north. And there's still, like, four more hours flight to go all the way to the end. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And so you moved to Santiago and when you were four or five years old. Yeah. What was it like growing up in Santiago? And did you, you know, San Chile is fairly, fairly classist and fairly closed off, especially 20 to 25 yeah. years ago. What was that like? It was horrible. I hated it. I wanted to do whatever, like not go to the school. I told my parents I don't want to go to school. I hated my school and the experiences like growing up here as a daughter of an immigrant family, uh, different skin color, different name. Even the fact that I was a vegetarian, like a Hindu vegetarian, was a problem. Uh, I can even remember at school, my classmates, like who would be called my friends, the quote, um, they would, like in a birthday party, they would take my hands uh, put them behind and they would force me to eat like bread and ham and egg knowing that I'm a vegetarian and I don't now, now I'm a, I am a vegan but back then I mean not even cheese I mean ham egg like that was a no-no right and they would force me to eat that or they would even say if we color the classroom black Kamala will get lost uh, and for a kid when you're growing up it's like terrible um, so me and my brother my younger brother we, we it was it was rough, uh, very rough. I, I hated it. Yeah, that's tough. And did did you end up studying outside of Chile or leaving Chile? No, never, just... never. I I've always lived and studied in Chile except for the past two years. Um, it was a rough childhood, but after entering what we call high school here, primero medio, segundo medio, enseñanza media, I think something 
something changed in me. I wanted to prove myself, not because of my skin color or my background. I started studying harder. I studied, I started proving myself beyond my name or my eating habits. And, and, and I think now those students that would bully me would ask my notebooks and uh, notes like for the exams and stuff like that. So I think I was able to show a different side of me and grow personally uh, out of the struggle of being bullied. And why science? Was, when, was there a, a, per, a specific moment or a person that made you get really interested in science? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I've asked myself that question and I've always been very passionate about science, uh, math and science. And uh, I mean, my, my family would also encourage me, you know, Indian parents with all the math and science kind of thing. Uh, but but they, would, they were more of, hey, study either engineering or medicine or law or commercial engineering, which is like BA business, here, yeah. business. Uh, here, so they were they were very traditional. I was like, hey, we've invested a lot in your. We, we even moved from Ariga to Santiago. Uh, uh, but uh, I, it, when I was in high school, I would study what have those who won a Nobel Prize studied, like those who've been change makers, those who discovered DNA, like Watson and Crick, uh, like oh, the ones who are working in genetic engineering, curing cancer, uh, working in electricity, climate change. What have they studied? Like, what are they doing? Why are they getting the jobs and, you know, building the things they want to build? And doing that small research, I realized it was scientists, you know, biochemists. And I started learning about biochemists in Chile. So there's a famous biochemist in Chile called Professor Paulo Alenzuela. He's a biochemist from Universidad de Chile. He discovered vaccine against hepatitis C. And, and it was the first uh, recombinant RNA work done in Chiron Corporation. And he was Chilean. So that role model and that work inspired me to pursue uh, science as a career, regardless of what people would say. Hey, why would you want to study science? Um, so it was a bit of that, like making a difference through science in the world. Uh, and what did you end up studying in university? I entered the weird career of biochemistry at the University of Chile. And when you were studying biochemistry, were there many women in your in your group in your in, in my group, I would say we were pretty balanced. There were some courses that did not have uh, many men, but in the faculty, well, the science faculty, you could tell that uh, especially in only chemistry or in the physics classes, mainly men. Like I, I remember taking uh, uh, quantum physics and, and Física Moderna y Física Particulas, which is particle physics, and sorry, and uh, modern physics, and they were all men. Um, and did you know when you were either in high school or university that you were going to use science to start a business or did you were you thinking okay i'm going to be a scientist i'm going to make discoveries and what was your your thinking i always wanted to do something like make a difference uh, and i did not know how can you make a difference uh, so my the first thought is you study science you work in a lab, so I study science and I worked in a lab. I worked in a, in a biotech lab where we were researching, um, they, these were RNAs, RNAs mitochondriales no codificantes, mitochondrials, non-coding RNAs, uh, in, um, it was a cancer research lab, uh, Andes Biotechnologies, uh, where we were working in diagnosis, molecular diagnosis and, um, and, and therapy. So that was my way of, of doing science, right? the way that I've learned how we could do science working in a lab. I also worked in a nanobiotech lab with nanoparticles uh, and the relationship of nanoparticles in cells. So that was that was fun and engaging, but building a company was like, uh, far-fetched. That was for other people to do. And I would work in those companies or in those labs, but I'd never thought of starting something on my own. And Maybe what, in the future. like. And what made you take the leap to start a company? Serendipity. Uh, it was total serendipity. It was one of the last years of my master's in biochemistry um, where me and my friends, we saw a poster in the university, in Universidad de Chile. It was a poster that said, Startup Weekend, change the world in 54 hours. It was a poster of a program or like a weekend hackathon or whatever you want to call it, 
organized by some random entrepreneurs from a program called Startup Chile. God knows what that is. Uh, and apparently they were forced to organize activities because that's how they would get some points. God knows what that is. And uh, something about startups. We had no idea what a startup is. Um, we would go to this event. People would speak about pitch and VC. God knows that like, we had no idea what that was like. What kind of formula is VC, VC? Like, what are they talking about? Uh, so it was uh, serendipity. And there we said, okay, Red Bull, pizza, nice logos, like government logos and Microsoft. And, you know, there's some like a prize at the end, like a Kinect you could win. Um, and, and mentoring hours, like, let's go. And they will teach us how to change the world in 54 hours. Now that sounded exciting for a scientist, right? Uh, awesome. I love, I love learning. Teach me how to change the world in 54 hours. It was nothing what we expected. Uh, we had to build something in 54 hours and pitch somewhere or something uh, and present the problem. And that's when I met my co-founder, which you met right before, Alvaro Jose Peralta, who's the CTO and co-founder of love for You. I met him there. He was finishing his master's in engineering from Universidad de Chile as well. And I was finishing my master's uh, biochemistry in the University of Chile, and I think that was the combination we and had. What year, more or less, would that have been? 2013, 28th of March, 2013. Wow, you got it down. Oh yes, indeed. That's interesting. That uh, startup weekend. Because I remember being in a startup weekend in Chile that we had to do as part of Startup Chile as our give back back in 2010. Mm -hmm. Didn't realize that there were more of them after that. That's that's cool. Yeah, I actually mm -hmm. remember the mentors. Uh, in fact, one of the mentors from Microsoft is now like a company advisor, uh, and he was a mentor back then, uh, and today he's a world advisor. And did you come up with this specific idea during the 54 oh, hours or something no, different? No, 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 no. Like, the, the vision of like the problem, there was a clarity in, in the problem. So we, we knew what the problem was. I suffered in my science education, my co-founder, he suffered in his science education in Colombia, he's Colombian, right? So we had a sense of the problem, the size of the problem, uh, probably there were many aspects of it. We had a vision of like how we would imagine the world to be if it was perfect, like everybody should have access to science. But the initial thought was through lab equipment like physical lab equipment when we would build the lab and we would, so we would actually build a spectrophotometer, low cost spectrophotometer, and then we would build a low cost microscope and then we would build all these labs low cost. Um, and then it was my co-founder and this mentor, they're like, hey, come on, we're not Toyota who can build and have an inventory and how much is that gonna cost? And I'm like, no, but the lab and, and the experiments are so important and they challenged us to think different and out of the box. And my co-founder being a software engineer, he said, okay, what, why don't we combine software and the physical? Okay, why don't we use what we already have in our pockets? Uh, why don't we check all the sensors? And there was some academic work around smartphone sensors. So we took that academic work and we started building on that. But that happened in a period of six months, not that first day. And when did you make the decision, we're gonna actually do this, we're gonna build this company and dedicate ourselves to this rather than going and getting a job at something more traditional. So we decided this was a company in January 2014. After getting into Startup Chile, that was another story. We didn't even know that we would get in Startup Chile. So let's record this with a smartphone, like new iPhone in our lab. So we recorded a pitch that has nothing to do to our current product, uh, but it had to do with our vision. We recorded the pitch, we got into Startup Chile, we did not know what we were we, what we were doing. We learned a lot. Horacio Melo back then, Esteban Vidal, Patti Hansen, like the early Startup Chile mentors and uh, leaders, they helped us a lot. And Startup Money ended. Startup Chile money ended in December 2013. And in January, we had to make a decision. Like, what are we going to do? Continue college, do this. Um, and we said, let's give it a shot. We incorporated the company. Um, and here we are after five years. <laughs> and so you have probably an interesting mix of uh, pushing and pulling on whether it's a good Id idea to start a company. So Chile, very conservative. They probably would think you're crazy to go start yeah. start a company. But immigrant parents also probably think maybe crazy. Yeah. But then also 
uh, people who have been pushing you to go do something in the world. So how did your family and also your friends take it when you said, I'm not going to go work in a, sci- in a lab, I'm going to go start a company? Yeah. So my friends understood it more than my family. My friends always knew that I was a bit crazy. So even in college, like in university, I would invite a Nobel laureate to Chile to speak to university students. And they're like, well, that's impossible. A Nobel Prize will never say yes to your invitation. Like you don't even have money. And I'm like, hell yes, I'm going to send 100 emails and we're going to invite a Nobel Prize because who knows in this class of 100 people, one of us could win the Nobel Prize and why? Like, we're just humans. And and I did. And after sending 100 emails, one of them said, yes, I'll go to Chile and speak to you students. <laughs> so, like, my my friends and my classmates, they kind of knew that that I was a bit different and I wanted to do more things. Um, but my my parents, my father especially, like, he, he struggled as an immigrant. So for him, the best thing was my kids study, they get a job, they get a stable income, and that's life, right? And we, you know, have a better family situation. That's like the story of the immigrant. And that's why I worked hard. I put you in a school that taught you English. Like my English is not as good as yours. Like make use of it. Um, and I think after five years, I've been able to convince them that I'm okay, regardless of the ups and downs. But, but yeah, in the beginning, I was like, stop this craziness, this startup thing. Even sometimes now, it's like, okay, enough. Like, no more traveling. Like, uh, when are you going to be stable? Um, it's been hard to convince them. And so when you started the business, what was the first big milestone that you passed where you said, this is going to be interesting. Um, this is starting to work. Every year I have like a new milestone then. So initially it was when students were actually using the product. Uh, and then teachers were actually using the product. Then when the first customer said, okay, I'm going to pay for this, and he actually paid for it. So every year, you, your milestones get higher and higher, and you're able to remove some peels of your onion until you have that product market fit. So for us, it's been a long path because in education technology or even in healthcare, it's a long-term business. Sales cycles are long, uh, and you don't only have to validate the business aspect, but you also, in healthcare, you have to validate if it's an FDA approved. A product in education does this have, have impact in pedagogy um, so in our businesses it, it, it is longer but it has higher impact so it, it has taken long for us to actually validate um, the product its impact it's so in general terms you can say hey you're experimenting so that's of course positive but no show me the numbers are they learning more uh, they, Have you done a randomized control trial? Uh, So on and so forth. So just last year, the Inter-American Development Bank financed um, a pilot project, an implementation in Sinaloa, Mexico, where we implemented with 10,000 students. They evaluated 3,800 students uh, with our product and a group, a control group without LAFRU, a treatment group with LAFRU, and those results just, just came back a couple of months ago. And we're very happy with the results because it's the first randomized control trial that we have where students increase their uh, knowledge, their self-perception of knowledge, and most importantly, their interest to pursue a STEM-related career. So I would say that's the biggest milestone um, uh, that I would say we've achieved. So you said a little while back, you were when you're thinking about doing the business, you imagined a perfect world. And so what, what are the problems in science education that you're trying to solve? Yeah. Oh. So many, but we focus on a few. Uh, so solving a social problem, you would say, hi, hey, that's the government's job. Why doesn't our government pay for it and solve this problem in healthcare and education? The problem is, like, the government did not invent iPhone, right? <laughs> the government did not invent Uber and improve the uh, mobilization or the transportation system of our world. So you need, uh, you need companies in the private sector, a good partnership between you know, PPP, public and private partnership, in order to move the needle forward. So uh, we see here in Latin America, especially, 88% of the schools don't have labs. And I say, come on, 88%? <laughs> yes, 88% don't have labs. And those who do have labs, guess what? They're not using the labs. They're not using the equipment. Okay, so why am I investing so much in buying those equipment? Okay, what happened then? The teachers. The teachers need training. The teachers need help. They need follow-up. We need to change structure and pedagogy. 
I didn't invent inquiry-based learning. I'm implementing it in a better way, right? Uh, so we're giving tools so that teachers and students can implement uh, this right pedagogy around science. Um, so that's one challenge, the lab equipment, the teacher training, where we're helping teachers, giving them tools, uh, pedagogical materials, so on and so forth. Uh, and then students are just not interested in science. They drop out. They will drop out rates here in Latin America. You go to Sinaloa, Mexico, they, they are inspired by Pablo Escobar, Chapo Guzman. They're inspired to be sicarios. Um, what happens to science? Why aren't they not inspired to be an Einstein or Marie Curie or Elon Musk? Right? Um, and improve the world we're living in. You know, see the world around you and improve it. So it's, it's hard to inspire so that it becomes aspirational. Leo Messi inspires me. I want to be like Leo Messi. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to play football and work hard and be like Leo Messi. Why can't it be like that in every industry and in every area? So we believe that talent is universal, but opportunities are not. So how can we give those opportunities? So, uh, so maybe the next Einstein or Marie Curie can be in a favela in Brazil, in the south of Chile, in Punta Arenas, in Minnesota, uh, and uh, who knows, right? Um, in Sinaloa, Mexico, or in the slum in Mumbai. And so that's where we want to give that opportunity so that everyone can have this lab in their pockets. So as part of solving this problem, you've had to raise financing from families, from funds, from yeah. grants, I think yeah. from government as well. Yeah. What's that process been like? <laughs> Everything. You know how the Death Valley has a curve, right? This, and there's, there's this, uh, in that curve, in the Death Valley, you can put all the funds there, <laughs> all the Corpo grants that I've received, you know, Corpo, IDB study, everything, you put it there and boom, we're out of it, I believe so. Um, because now we're making more money, we have more clients, uh, schools here in Chile, in Mexico, in the US, hopefully they're paying us, many are renewing, so we're very happy about that. Um, but yeah, so uh, we raised money here in Chile, we started with the grants, Corfo grants. Corfo is like our venture capital here, right? Before Magma, we'll speak about Magma later, but it, uh, in La Ausencia de Magma, in Magma's absence, we have Corfo, right? The Corfo grants. So we've... Uh, saludos a Corfo. <laughs> <laughs> Regards to Corfo. So we, we've received many grants from Corfo. Um, as opposed to, for example, my competitor has raised $10 million. No, and we've only raised one-tenth of that, uh, mainly with Corpos and other private investors, funds, funds in the U.S., funds in Mexico, and funds here in Chile. And what have you learned raising money from funds across the region and in the U.S.? Oh, um, it's a people's business. Uh, so we've had bad experiences and good experiences, like a bad experience where we had to clean our cap table. Uh, and uh, good experiences where our angels stick to us every single day, every year. Like I can go to them like crying and they're like, Kumal, what's the problem? How to solve it? What do we have to do? Okay, I'll put the first check. Who's putting the next one? You're putting the next one? Okay, we're putting the next one. Problem solved. Um, so it's about people. I've, I've learned that uh, if you trust them and they trust you, you can do great things together. Uh, and we've got great partners in that sense. I can mention some like uh, great partners with NextDB in Argentina, uh, in, in Argentina, uh, and others in, in Mexico who are helping us, introducing us to clients, top contacts. I don't have a network, so what does a fund give you? What does an investor give you besides the money? Money is it should be a commodity. You can earn money, you can get money from a bank, but what is the value of an investor? I want his network, not his net worth. That's important too. But I want his network because he's gonna introduce me to potential investors. He's gonna, for future rounds, he's gonna introduce me to great clients. I don't know the secretary of education of the state in Jalisco, Guanajuato, blah, blah, blah. My investors, they do. They've got great contacts. They have coffee together and they play golf together. I don't play golf, right? So, uh, uh, so they, my investors in the Bay Area also, great contacts. Their kids go to the same fancy school introduce me to the fancy school right so that's what what i think uh do i trust the person after learning all this you know after failing a couple of times do i trust him do i want to do i want him to call me the good days and the bad days like am i willing to have lunch or breakfast and dinner with these folks or uh, this person uh constantly will i have 
the gut and the courage to tell him when there is a problem? Because you can hide too the problems. You know what happened in Mexico recently with, with, uh, with one entrepreneur and his investors. Um, will I have the gut to be transparent with him? Yes, I will. He or she is the person I need in my board or I need in my company or I need as an investor. So I, today I go, these are my problems. How do you know? I need help to solve them. And, and they've been great. So in most of that response, you referred to investor as he and him. And you are a female founder. <laughs> yes. What's that been like being a female founder, either raising money, making sales, yeah. and also the comparison between how you've been treated in Latin America versus the US? Yeah, well, you can tell the difference. Uh, and when I feel the difference, when I feel that a potential investor is treating me differently than what he would treat a male entrepreneur, for me, it's a no-no. I, I can tell. It's very obvious. You can even tell when an investor has been an entrepreneur and who, one who has not been an entrepreneur. Huge difference in the conversation, in the quality of the questions, in the suggestions. Huge difference. <laughs> Out of all my investors, uh, in, in, in the funds, and the, all my angel investors are men. All the fund investors are men, except one, which is Marta from NextDP. Uh, but she's part of a team also, like Gonzalo, Ariel, and, and Marta. I, I, I feel very comfortable speaking with her. And, and she's, she's the one who also looked after me as, like, as a human, like, Ma, are you resting? Like, how's your health? And, um, and, and very encouraging. But the rest are all men. Uh, and your question was about if... What's, what's, the, what's it been like uh, raising money and then even doing sales yeah. as, a, as a female entrepreneur? And is there a difference between Latin America and the US? Yeah. Or, or in Latin America, is there a difference between the countries? Yeah. Um, I see more differences here, even in the way they treat you outside or inside the meeting room. Uh, even when I sell like, the product to physics teacher who are almost men, like the American Association of Physics Teacher, all of them are men. Um, so I go and they were all men, all physics teacher, the leader was a man. Uh, I went with my colleague who's also a man. Thank God he went there because they were speaking with him. He was new in the company, but I wanted him to do the sell. It was like part of the you know, process. And they were all talking to him, speaking to him. But when the technical questions came, my gentleman-like colleague, uh, who's fantastic, he's like, so that those technical questions, I will go to my colleague, Komal, uh, who's the scientist, and she'll be able to answer. So I'm like, yeah, and the acceleration versus time graph, this is what happened, and the sonometer, the, transform the Fourier transformative analysis, blah, blah, blah. And after I had to prove them that I knew my shit, they would look at me. Otherwise, I was just ignored as a female assistant. Um, it's very common. Even in events, uh, I go, give you an example here. I went to an event, entrepreneurs, da da da. I was ignored until someone else said, like, hey, are you Kumar from La For You? You're based in Silicon Valley now. I've heard you guys are doing great. That's when people started looking at me. Otherwise, I was just ignored, sitting there with my orange juice, when the rest were with their wine glasses. And they were speaking about small things, about an investment from this and that of $25,000 because of a cap, which is a very low cap, and they couldn't... I raised more money with a higher cap. They didn't even, you know, mind in asking, hey, what, what does your company do? Can, do you have any suggestions? I could have helped them, but they ignored me completely. It's, it's very common, especially, I would say, more in Latam um, and in the Bay Area as well. Uh, I think that's changing, though. All well, my current investors, the thing is, my current investors, most of them are parents. For example, my, one of my angel investors, he's a father, and he respects his wife, his daughter. They, he's like, no, I'm not the smart one. My wife is the smart one. Like, so they, they're people who respect women and men equally, and you can tell the difference. That's the, those are the kind of people you want. In, in your company. So you talked about Silicon Valley and being based there. Uh, I listened to one of your podcasts in Spanish about <laughs> what it was like making that that jump. So what are some of the things you learned about going to Silicon Valley? Yeah, it was crazy. Um, I don't think I would have been able to go without a network. So I had my angel investors who had a network there. There was a product accelerator from a game company, Zynga that was there with the money, the office space, and everything. So that helped. 
settle there, like the soft landing. Uh, otherwise, the Chilena knocking doors, it's, uh, it was almost impossible, right? Um, so good soft landing. But then when we started, when we tried to grow with little money, that's when the problem started. Uh, I made very bad decisions in terms of hiring. I hired, I hired senior executives that were not ready to sell a scrappy startup product. I did most of the sales and not the senior executive whom I hired uh, to do the sales. So it was, it was, it was hard. It was, um, for an early stage company, I would have done things differently. I wouldn't have hired expensive Bay Area uh, folks. Um, and now there was difference in language, in culture. Like the, team would, the team in the US would not speak Spanish. So even if they had requirements for the team in Chile, uh, design, hey, we have to change this in the website and this document, blah, 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 oh, there's a typo. They just couldn't communicate. So I, instead of executing and selling, I was just managing two languages and two offices and you know, operations that were not worth it. Uh, bad idea. So lots of Latin American founders have the dream of going to launch in the US or in Silicon Valley. What are some of the things besides for don't hire the really expensive senior person? Yeah. Would you give them? Yeah. Uh, have local investors like even. So, for example, my local my first local investors were not like the hardcore Silicon Valley Sequoia Capital or the whatever capital. They were angels that had relationship with Chile and the US. So they were angels in Berkeley, right? He, he had a house in Berkeley, had exits in, in the Bay Area, but he was Chilean. Uh, other angel investor had an office in Miami and had new people from the Endeavor Network. So when you, when you have people you trust in the US who are Chilean or Latinos, Mexicans, Colombians, your doors are open in those networks. Uh, so don't do Silicon Valley tourism. You want to go tourism, use Google Earth. Like that's easier and cheaper. Don't buy a ticket just to, oh, I'm gonna go to Google and I'm gonna knock doors. No, 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 no. Like the warm, well, the warm intros are the best intros. And when, when Silicon Valley investors see that you have local investors trusting in you, they're gonna trust as well if they care about it. Um, so that's something I found. My Silicon Valley investor, um, I met him in 2014 and he invested in 2016. It took two years of relationship building for him to invest. Uh, so, and we keep building relationships. So know that this is a relationship business. Um, don't just go for the heck of it. And what's okay, next? Something else. You need to go where your industry is strong. Like if you are in the mining industry, Silicon Valley is not, not data mining, like real, like copper, lithium, like mining industry. Chile is probably a better place to be, right? Uh, not Silicon Valley. But if you're going to build Boston, for example, for biotech. Um, so think also about your industries. For us, uh, the Bay Area was great to know about companies like Class Dojo and Edmodo and um, all the edtech investors like Learn Capital, Reach Capital, Owl Ventures, they're, they're all in the Bay Area. Yeah, there's a beehive here. This one's just a moth, so we're, we're going to be fine. Okay, we're it's just a moth. Okay. It's not going to get us. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the Chilean ecosystem. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so in um, the company today, what's, how's it doing? What, what are the clients and what's next for you? Yeah. So um, we had an important milestone in Mexico and that has opened many doors in Mexico. So we're, uh, our, our client base is growing in Mexico. Our clients, finally, our clients in Chile are renewing their contracts. And first it was smaller contracts, like $200 contracts and $300 contracts. And then last year started being $1,000 contracts. And now we're speaking about $10,000 contracts that are renewing. So that's like annual recurring revenue that we're getting. And for the first time, I would say we have, we're building a sales process. We know our numbers, we know our metrics, we know where to invest. Uh, and we're looking forward to grow uh, the sales team and add new products to increase the annual contract value. So we're thinking my, my, my product hat changed from product hat to sales hat and now from sales hat to financial hat uh, where I can project sales revenue costs uh, and, and analyze the business in those terms. Do you have any books, blogs, podcasts, documentaries, 
anything that you like to recommend to people? Yeah, I, I, depending on the stage of your emotional stage and the emotional roller coaster that a startup can can be. Um, so if you're struggling, yeah. I not enjoy it, but I could cry along. Uh, the hard things are hard things. Uh, I think that there's a chapter called the struggle or survival. Uh, those are like chapters that when I was going through it, it helped me read. I cannot be the only one. Um, I, I also go to Founders Meditation. Uh, like in the Bay Area, there's this group, Founders Meditation. Uh, I practice, whenever I can, I practice meditation. There's some, there some apps for meditating. So, um, hard things are hard things. There's one that I like, very easy to read, Delivering Happiness um, in Pursuit of Passion, Purpose and Profit. Um, I'm reading right now, also very good, Measure What Matters, um, that's also very good. Um, there's another one called Conscious Business, uh, Fred Kaufman, I think, um, and I've, I've read all Sheryl Sandberg's books, of course, and she also recommends Conscious Business, being very conscious with people, building relationships, etc., with your own team, with your investors, with your clients, um, so these are, these are books that I enjoy reading. So if you could go back in time to just around that startup weekend, knowing what you know today, what advice would you give yourself? Oof, ah, uh, meditate more. Uh, don't get so angry easily. I remember getting desperate. And I was 24 years old. Well, you know, that's what, five years ago. So um, I would struggle a lot when things would not work. And it's just normal. I I don't know why I did not use the the, the scientist heart where things are gonna fail and, and and things are just slower than what you think. Things take longer than what you think. Um, and just you know have that peace of mind that in the end things are gonna be okay. But you just follow your plan. Try. You're gonna fail a couple of times, uh, probably more than what you think you will. Um, and just trust your instincts. When something feels wrong, just don't go for it, even if someone else is telling you that you should go that path. Uh, I just trust my gut feeling a lot more. I think those are great pieces of advice, not only for business, but also for living a good life. So <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time to share your story on the podcast. I no, really enjoyed the conversation. No, same here. Thank you very much. Thanks again for listening to this podcast with Komal Dadlani. If you enjoyed it, please share it with a friend or give us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to Anka and Sophia for the production help and hope you have a great rest of your day.